Now on BBC One, in full circle. unbroken Southern Ocean separate New Zealand from this, the southernmost point of the American continent, a place feared and respected by generations of mariners, Cape Horn. Commander, is this the real Cape Horn? Because I think, you know, I, I know it's a place of mountainous seas and, and, and shipwrecks and all that. It's like a mill pond today. It is real, really, but we have been very lucky. Yeah. This is very unusual to have this uh, fine weather, really. So it's it's true that normally it's it's a it's a pretty yes, rough I think place to yes. To no more than twenty percent of the time the, the weather is like this moment. Really. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get across to the so we'll get across onto the uh, onto Cape Horn itself without any trouble. Cape Horn is a place few people ever see, let alone visit. Antarctica is only 500 miles away. This is the one place on Earth where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet. Commander Marino and the Chilean Navy are our hosts and saviors. They know these unpredictable waters better than anyone else. Apart from its security role, the Navy supplies scattered communities, saves lone yachtsmen, and just this once, a not quite lone television presenter. So there's just uh, the three of them here. Uh, the three, I think, a couple of dogs. You think they'll be pleased to see us? Yes, they, I'm sure, yes. <laughs> they don't receive visits really, yeah, very no, often. Yeah. We get many visitors. So it is that at four o'clock on a May afternoon, I land on Cape Horn. Ah, there's Alice. Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you start. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh boy, obviously hasn't seen any, anyone for a while. <laughs> Come on. Right, take us to your master. <laughs> So how long do these uh, guys spend out here at a time? They before? stay for two months here. Yeah. Every two months, they, we have to chain them. Yeah. And during that two months, do they see other people? Do they get visitors? Not very often, really. Yeah. Could be that... Cape Horn is, in fact, a tiny oh, island, twice. no bigger than Diomede, where my journey began. The few buildings here are a surprising mixture. A lighthouse, I expect, but not a church. Is this chapel just for the three people who, who yes, live here? Yes, yes, only for them, really. But normally, every two months, we, we send the priest from Puerto Williams. Yeah. Uh, when they are, we are changing the people, and then they have a, they have a, a little service, of a service here, ah. yes. Outside Antarctica, this is the southernmost place of worship in the world. Obviously, looks after it, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah. Gosh, it's such a bleak place. It's, oh, it's beautiful. Still, still and peaceful. The extraordinary thing about having come here to Cape Horn, besides being a sort of lifetime's dream realized, is that it is the very end of the continent of America. Those are the last few yards of America over there. Um, or the first few, and for me they are the first few, because now I turn north to follow that spine of mountains which winds its way all the way up to the Bering Strait and Diomede from which I started, at uh, another 10,000 miles to go. 
Before I set out, I can't resist sending a card from Cape Horn Post Office. So this will, this will have the, the um, Cape Horn stamp on it. Be sent from Cape Horn. Yes. That's great. How did it get? How did it get out? We will have to send it, but go with, take it in the ship and send it from Puerto Williams then. Oh, which ship? Our ship. Our, our ship. Yes. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, <laughs> oh, thank you. Let's I go see. there. Easy, easy done. <laughs> Oh dear, I thought there was a post box somewhere. <laughs> Maybe I'll institute one. The Palin Memorial Post Box. Oh, yes. We turn north for the first time on our journey, picking our way around Tierra del Fuego, aiming for Punta Arenas, where the road begins. Our route follows the Beagle Channel. It's a safer alternative to rounding the Horn. It's called after HMS Beagle, a British ship which discovered and charted these waters in 1831. Charles Darwin sailed on the Beagle. His theory of evolution was shaped by his observations of this dramatic, ever-changing landscape. Darwin called this nature's workshop. There is a real sense here of scenery being created, of solid rock under remorseless pressure. Next morning, the weather has changed utterly. We're through the Beagle Channel and putting ashore at a small bay. There is a unique record here of the price paid by the first British sailors. Commander Pringle Stokes, RN, captained the Beagle on its first voyage. He never returned home. A simple cross reads, in memory of Commander Pringle Stokes, RN, who died from the effects of the anxieties and hardships incurred while surveying the western shores of Tierra del Fuego. The truth is, he committed suicide. At Punta Arenas, I renew acquaintance with two old friends, Patricio from Pole to Pole and Magellan from Geography O-Level. Magellan, the man who first called the Pacific the Pacific. Yep. Nice monument. It is, and, isn't it? Yeah, yeah you know, powerful. quite powerful, quite powerful. And the good thing of this, at least for me, that this is one of the fewest monuments in Chile that is yeah. not related to the military. No, I suppose not. Although he did wipe out the Indians. Yeah. Ah. Well, he didn't, others did. Now, this is the lucky toe. If you kiss this, you come back to Punta Arenas. I yes. did that when we went to the poles. That's so. why you are yeah, back here I'm now. Yeah, well, I should do it again, I think. Yep. Yeah, go. Okay. Mm, go for it. Just a quick peck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? I like People it. People still believe yeah. in that, do they? Oh, yes. They still yes, do it. still yeah. believe in that. Yes. Our first northbound road runs 160 miles out of Punta Arenas and no further. This is our first sight of the Andes, the Torres del Paine Mountains, a foretaste of what lies ahead of us all the way to Alaska. I mean, they're stupendous up, up there. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen peaks quite so sort of jagged and so tall as those as the towers through there. So they're probably very new geologically. I mean, that must be, this, well, is, this is kind of early. Yeah, I suppose, well, I mean, you know, yeah, I suppose but I, when I was here the, the first time, they were here. <laughs> Our only way north from here is by boat, from a place called Puerto Natales. 
It's evening when we reach our destination. There's a cargo ship, the Puerto Eden, leaving at midnight. It's rough and ready and smells ominously like a farmyard. Islands litter the southwest coast of Chile like pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. Our route dodges and ducks between them to the island of Chiloe. It will take half a week to get there. Sunrise reveals that overnight the Puerto Eden has become a Noah's Ark. Sheep and cattle are squeezed onto trailers that are themselves squeezed onto the cargo decks. The animals look healthy enough in the fresh sea air and the morning sunshine. The truth is that for four days and nights, they will have nowhere else to go. The human cargo may have more room to move, but not much more to do. I try to remember how to play chess and beat myself quite convincingly. There is excitement later as we approach a shallow and dangerous narrows called the Kirke Pass. With so few passengers aboard, it's easy to get a grandstand view. As our captain cuts speed to negotiate the pass, we become a welcome diversion for the local seals and sea lions. They follow our progress with the joyful expectancy of those who've been waiting for a ship to run aground for years. With less than six feet to spare beneath her keel, the Puerto Eden sails through the Kirke Pass with aplomb and a blast of self-satisfaction. The offshore island of Chiloe has a reputation for poverty, superstition, independence, black magic, music and rain. To find out if any of this was earned, I talked to Catherine Hall, an American now living here, on a typical Chilote day. My guidebook did say that, that Chiloe was renowned for rain. It's chilly. <laughs> accurate today. It's usually like this in the winter. It also said it's renowned for witchcraft. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes, the, uh, the people here say, no creo en brujo caray, pero los hay, los hay. And that means, I don't believe in witches, but they exist. Yeah. <laughs> they do exist. There are witches here. <laughs> I believe you, there are ever, two. Have you ever met one? Not that I know of, that's why I say, but I think maybe, I'm not sure. You see, this is the thing about the witches, that they only reveal their identity one to another. There is very, very secret society. And uh, we believe that this form of operating like a secret society is from the days of the Spanish conquest. It was a kind of a resistance to scare them. What are the characteristics of the, well, the chilote? The, it's very hard to explain the chilotes. Mm. I'm, I'm just going to have to, to get you to meet some. them. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to take sure, you to meet sure. them, and, yeah. and then you'll know how they are. They're, uh. they're, they're very you... special. Catherine's right. No sooner have I arrived at a local festivity than I'm put to work. Peeling the potatoes. Sonia's done 153. I've done four. Sonia is my host at a curanto, a sort of traditional do-it-yourself barbecue. Ahora tiene que comprar papa que no esté empelada porque cuando llegue a su país se haga este mismo trabajo. Trouble is, belong to that. Softy world of people who buy Marks and Spencers ready peeled. I haven't seen potato peel in our house for years. Actually, that's not true. It's not at all true. My wife won't thank me for saying that. It's just I don't see much of it, as you can tell. I do more cerebral things. Hablo un poco español. Sí? Yeah. Poco, poquito, 
Poquito, poquito. Yeah, but uh, I like the patatas. Oh. The Porque patatas si... that may well have originally grown on this island. This is the first Hola, ya where no... they came from. Ah, huh? estamos pelando papa. One of the original sí, ella world es spuds. Una, una gringuita igual, eh? It's not like any barbecue I've ever been to. Some of the preparations are frankly alarming. Se le pone un poco de manteca de chancho. Shaving cream. What's that? That's fat. That's. Es. Yeah. Y chicharrones. Yeah. También de chancho. Pork and fat. Eh? Mm. Todo se pone. Don't try this at home. Todo se amasa, junta, se junta. Yeah. Yeah. The fire is kindled with special slow-burning wood. These special slow-burning properties are only enhanced by the start of steady but generous rainfall. At which point the guests start to arrive. Despite the downpour, the stones have heated nicely and are ready for the clams. Inside, dancing begins. The cueca is one of the oldest dances of Chile. The man plays the strutting cockerel and the woman the playful hen. By now, the barbecue resembles the scene of a serious accident. But still more food goes on, bedded down beneath strips of fresh-cut turf. At last, the curanto is ready. Somewhere under here, apart from my own homemade rissoles, are clams, mussels, pork chops, salmon, ham, and strings of sausages. All we've got to do now is find them. Chiloe is indeed an eccentric place, but they do know how to have a good time on a rainy afternoon. And where else could you learn to play the horse's jawbone? E flat. E flat, gone for good. It never did stop raining on Chiloe, but by the time we move on to the Chilean capital of Santiago, 650 miles north, it is dry and warm and suddenly, shockingly, full of people. Five million of Chile's 13 million people live in Santiago, where the most popular name seems to be O'Higgins. Bernardo O'Higgins, illegitimate son of an Irish immigrant, liberated Chile from the Spaniards in 1818. And they haven't forgotten him. There's even a street named after Bernardo in the cemetery.
The cemetery has a haunting and powerful presence. Miracles have been known to take place. Away from the tombs of the rich and famous are the remains of those who died in the repression that followed the military coup of 1973. They were murdered quietly, methodically and secretly, and their bodies dumped outside the cemetery. Their names are still not known. This dark, unhappy period of Chilean history is remembered by the most powerful memorial of them all. A wall of marble bears the names of those victims who've been identified. From the President of the Republic himself down to the most ordinary people. Some of them children as young as two years old. These are the names of the dead and disappeared. Another 2,000 remain to be added. The iron grip of military dictatorship has loosened. General Pinochet and his army may wait in the wings, but Chile is once more regarded as a well-behaved democracy. In the Plaza de Armas, life goes on. Men without women cluster round the open-air chessboards. If you're lonely, this is the place to find a partner. For chess, of course. Spurred on by my great success against myself on the boat up from the south, I decide it's time to put my newfound skills to the test. Ah. It's a bloodbath. He wins before I've even got the hang of the clock. It's <laughs> finished already. Oh, it's just getting warmed up. I know. Next time I'll put my glasses on. Okay. okay. No, thanks, Gustav. That's good. So that's really... That's you're, really well because you're lost again. So yeah. You but you're allowed five, five minutes. Five minutes, I guess. Right. How long did we have? Well, we are, we are already playing just for maybe three minutes. Three minutes? Yes. Sure. As evening falls over downtown Santiago, the hilltop park of Cerro Santa Lucia offers a quiet getaway from city smog and traffic. Or so they tell me. What they didn't tell me was that it's also the pitch of a local evangelist who turns up every night to give vent to his passionate feelings. He's not the only one. Next day, we set out on an adventurous, some would say foolhardy mission. 400 miles due west of Valparaiso is one of Chile's most remote possessions, a volcanic speck in the Pacific called the Juan Fernandez Islands.
This is the start of the Chilean winter, and our flight has twice been postponed at the last minute. It's fine for now, but any rain will turn this dirt airstrip to mud, and if that happens, we'll be stranded. The runway is just about long enough to accommodate a light aeroplane if the wind's in the right direction. And we all breathe a sigh of relief when we're safely down and heading for the terminal. Though it seems unlikely at first, the islands are home to four and a half thousand people, one of whom is my guide, Marietta. Well, it's in the lap of the gods, really. We've got to move on. It depends on the weather. This is our car to go to the bay. Then you can take the boat to go to the town. Right. OK. I'll, I'll just join you in a minute. Just got to pay a call. The facilities are not fully geared up for tourism. Some of the flights have been delayed indefinitely. The main road from the airport starts well on the hard volcanic rock, but peters out at a rocky bay full of basking seals. From here, with a bit of luck, a local boatman will take us around the coast to the only town. These islands are world famous. A man called Alexander Selkirk was abandoned on this coast in 1704 and lived alone here until his rescue in 1709. Daniel Defoe was inspired to write a book of his story. He changed Selkirk's name to Robinson Crusoe. Three hundred years on, we retrace Selkirk's first slippery footsteps. A few hundred yards away, they've tidied up the cave from which he must have scanned the Pacific for four and a half years. He lived here with only goats, rats, and wild cats for company. In reality, there was no Man Friday. In Robinson Crusoe, Defoe makes it all sound rather romantic. He's got a bit, I've got my, my little book here, which is something about him. I fancied myself now like one of the ancient giants, which was said to live in caves and holes in the rocks where none could come at them. This was it, this is his actual cave and hole in the rock. I'd say somebody could come at you here. Yeah. Alexander Selkirk was by all accounts a thoroughly unpleasant, quarrelsome character who deserved all he got. But after spending four minutes in a cave where he spent four years, I come away with a sneaking admiration for the old bastard. How long have you lived here? I've been here for five years. And where did you live before? In Santiago. Don't you, don't you miss Santiago? No. I miss the cinema or the newspaper, but that's all. What brought you here? Why did you come to uh, this lonely island in the middle of nowhere? I came like a tourist for five days, and I never left the island. Did you um, marry an islander then? Yes. I have two kids, and it's a very nice place for the kids because it's very safe. They can go everywhere they want, there's no danger. There is something appealing in the silence and seclusion of this dot in the ocean. Unlike Selkirk, I'm in no hurry to leave. my last day in Santiago. 
In La Pintana, one of the poorest parts of the city, a group calling themselves Caleta is working with the young children who grow up in these tough surroundings. Caleta, which means refuge, tries to create an alternative to poverty that doesn't involve drugs or crime. The idea is to get everyone to muck in and learn something, even if they make a fool of themselves. Of course, I'm in my element. Caletta, with few resources except energy and enthusiasm, is committed to helping these children. Very few others are. It's time to move north again, from the fertile centre of Chile to the bare and spectacular landscape of the Atacama Desert. Trapped between the high Andes and the cold, rainless offshore current, there are places in the Atacama where no rain has ever fallen. This is what I imagine it must be like to drive across the face of the moon. Before and after me, there is utter silence. Nothing moves in this petrified landscape, day after day after day. But not far below the surface, there is plenty going on. At El Tatio, in the mountains high above the desert, the Earth's crust bubbles and boils, and geysers belch steam like factory chimneys. Well, contrary to appearances, this uh, great jacuzzi of a landscape is actually set in a very, very cold part of the Andes. It's about, oh, my wonderful gadget here says it's about minus 10, and we are at 4,270 metres, which is, wait a minute, 14,190 oh, feet, uh, which is, I think, the highest I've ever been in my life. Um, unfortunately, Earth has provided its own natural warming device here, which is just a blowhole. Ah, now for an Atacama breakfast, an egg boiled on the Earth's crust. Oh! Ow! Oh, 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 shoot. Oh, oh. Brilliant, just brilliant. It's a long way to come, but it's worth it. As in many great wildernesses of the Pacific Rim, from Siberia to Australia, the rocks beneath the Atacama contain some of the most valuable minerals on Earth. Chukikamata is a company town, built on copper. 
Over the last 80 years, an amphitheater two and a half miles long and one and a half miles wide has been gouged out. Every week, a controlled explosion blasts more rock away. This week, there's a special guest countdown. Yeah. Oh. Cinco, cuatro, tres, dos, uno, fuego. Chukikamata is a world of giants. It's the largest open pit mine in the world. Shovels lift 60 tons at a time and fill dump trucks high as a two-story house. Each of these tires that are rolling over our cameraman cost $12,000. But this is only half the operation. I'm taken down to the smelting plant and foundry, where thousands of tons of rock are turned into tiny amounts of pure copper. Chile is the world's largest copper producer. These furnaces have been working continuously for seven months. Despite pollution problems and recent scares over arsenic poisoning, neither Chile nor the world could afford to shut down Chukicamata. Arica is Chile's most northerly town. It's nearly 3,000 miles from Cape Horn. It has a church designed by Eiffel, of tower fame, and a rail link with Bolivia. This isn't it. Twice a week, a railway service leaves Arica for the Bolivian capital, La Paz. It takes forever. Do you want a hand? Can I help? Can I help? It's just only two of you. Do all. <laughs> It's going to take two hours, OK? Yeah. You've got a system. <laughs> Captain Hook up there and down here. I rarely felt quite as embarrassed at travelling with 45 cases. Each one must be hoisted up by hand and stowed on the roof, for the train is quite small. In fact, it's a lot smaller than most of us had expected. Some passengers are local, some have come from countries far away. None have come quite as far as the train itself. <coughs> Wet across the Andes on a rail bus built for the branch lines of Munich 30 years ago. From the world's tiniest galley, two of our three-man Bolivian crew produce the first of several hot dinners. This line was built by the British in 1911. The chief engineer, John Roberts Jones, died of malaria during its construction. At one point, it climbs a thousand feet every three miles. All this land used to belong to Bolivia, but Chile seized it in 1884. Now Bolivia has no link with the sea, except by arrangement with Chile and Peru. Our engine needs constant cooling. Water is pumped through a plastic pipe which runs the length of the track. In this shadeless, treeless desert, the nine o'clock from Arica has developed a considerable thirst. Three and a half hours after leaving the Pacific, we're at 10,000 feet and still climbing. Um. 
freight wagons from the mineral mines of the Andes are a reminder of how vital this railway is. In a land of harsh climate and impassable mountains, this is the only lifeline. It's also my first taste of the Altiplano, the high plateau of the Andes, where the air is thin and simple things suddenly become difficult. The main, main feeling is just shortage of breath, shortage of oxygen, and also slight, just ever such a slight wooziness in the brain. I feel even, you know, more than, more than usual. Just want to sort of quietly sink off to sleep, as I'm sure does the entire crew. As if to confirm that I've arrived on the high plain, herds of llamas are everywhere. They're the Andean beast of burden, domesticated by the Incas. Unlike us, they're perfectly adapted to this rarefied air. Six and a half hours and a few llamas after leaving Arica, we've reached the Bolivian border. It's only 130 miles from the Pacific, but everything is different. We're entering the poorest country in South America. Up here, the walls are made of mud, and the soldiers' uniforms are a shocking contrast to their crisp counterparts in Chile. Maybe it's Bolivia or another miraculously produced dinner, but everyone started talking to each other. They're very adventurous, New Zealanders, <laughs> all over the world. The quietest parts of the world. There's There's New no Zealanders there. <laughs> Why is that? What, what, what's the reason for it, do you think? I don't know. I guess because we're so isolated, so far away from everything. It's good to get out and... So you come to Bolivia? That's <laughs> <laughs> because... <laughs> How are you feeling? Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Is it the altitude? It's the, uh, it gives you the headache, yeah. nausea, and uh, it's hard to breathe. You start to wheeze. Yeah. Did you ex not expect this? No, the guidebooks I, tell I, you about I, it. The, the book said there'd be oxygen on the train. And I was kind of hoping it would be. But when I asked him, was there oxygen? I said, you know, like this. And he says, no, Columbia. And he says, <laughs> I said, no, I don't want that. I want oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now I get cooked tea. Oh, you've got the cooked tea. tea. We haven't got that the cooked tea is healthy. Is it working? Yes. That's if you keep well. drinking it, but yeah. the problem is, is you drink it and you get a run and pee. Yeah. So you're drinking and peeing. And yeah, when you're close to the place. Blue, well. yes. Yep. Does it make you feel a little high? Uh, yeah, a little bit mm. uh, lightheaded. Yeah. Lightheaded. Right. Good. But you still have the headache. Is it the journey of a lifetime? It's the journey of everyone's dream. Coca leaf tea is illegal on the Chilean part of the journey, but up here, two and a half miles high, it's a tried and tested way to soften the effect of altitude. A few hours later, the lights of La Paz twinkle below us. The end is near. I've been climbed all the way up over the Andes very successfully. We just could see the lights of La Paz in the distance, beginning to feel a little bit complacent, and suddenly there's a juddering uh, from the bogies underneath, and we actually have ridden the points here, <laughs> and we're, we're still about an, an hour from La Paz. Uh, lots of people are trying to help out. People are emerging from the darkness all the time. Basically, what they're trying to do is to get it back on the on the rails by putting stones down, reversing back up, so the stones reverse up over the stones and back onto the railway line. That sounds extremely unlikely to me, but we're having a go. You hear it? Ah.
Not bad, the rock theory of uh, how to rerail a train. It, it obviously works. Just got to have a derailment where there's plenty of rubble. The delay is much less than we'd expected. After all, what's one hour on a 14-hour journey? But the new mood of euphoria is sadly misplaced. Trouble awaits at the next level crossing. The gates to La Paz are opened for us, but no one's been told we're coming. As you can see, we've got a right-of-way problem here. Um, this is the railway line, and this is the road, and uh, our conductor's trying to get people to clear out of the way. That's it. They've cleared them out so we can go on. Getting to La Paz is not easy. Go on, off you go. Barring a few drunks, dogs, and dumped rubbish, the rest of our journey to this, the highest capital in the world, is plain sailing. To our enormous relief, the lights are still on at La Paz station when our heroic vehicle finally pulls in. We've crossed the Andes at 16.4 miles an hour. I'm not sure if it's a baggage trolley or a hearse that comes to meet us. Quite frankly, either would suit me. And there's a return visit to that episode of Full Circle this Wednesday night at 10.50 here on BBC One. To the happiest of families. I love, love, love you lot. So I'm taking you out for dinner. Yes! I think you're the most gorgeous creature I've ever seen. Come moments of temptation. Oh, it can't be. It's, it's Beverly Duffy. It's my bed. What are you thinking? I'm thinking fancy a weekend in Paris. Oh, I can tell you still fancy me. Oh, I just wish I had more than one life to live. Who could resist? Life isn't a dress rehearsal. Take me and make my life complete! Dawn French, Phil Daniels and Michael Maloney, starring... Sex and Chocolate. Next Sunday, 9.05 on BBC One. This is Accident and Emergency at one of Britain's largest hospital trusts. It's Sunday night and the cold weather is beginning. The hospital has 1,400 beds, but the number currently vacant for the casualty staff is... None. There's no beds for anybody now. The government has attempted to offset the impending crisis, but will £300 million really make a difference when it's spread across the whole of the NHS? Panorama reports on a bleak winter prospect, tomorrow at 10 on BBC One.